15th at 10 a.m. in the morning. And let's start with the uh, roll call. So um, members, get ready to indicate whether you're here. All right, Senator Prasansky. Uh, here by video, and unfortunately, we'll need to leave uh, about 1130. Thank you. Senator Hansel. Senator Hansel, present by video in California, and I too will have to leave about 1130. Thank you. Representative Marsh. Um, Marsh is here by video. Representative Morgan. Morgan is present by video, and I think we should all leave at 1130. That sounds like a great day to me. <laughs> uh, Rob Bovet. See him yet. Scott Winkles. Sheriff Stickler. Present by video. Courtney Moran. Courtney Moran, present by video, but my camera's not working. Sorry. Matt Cyrus. Matt was just in the prior meeting, um, so I bet he's going to be jumping over here. Jay Noller. Amanda Metzler. Present. Brent Kenyon. Uh, present by video. Lauren Henderson. Good morning, everyone. Present by video. Andre Ursa. Uh, present by video. Steve Marks. I'm sure he'll be joining soon. Uh, Josh Eastman. Present by video. Amanda Kraus. Kraus. Uh, Jake Johnstone. Present by video. Amanda Swanson. Present by video. And Tyler Bechtel. Here by video. Great. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. I think this is the third meeting um, of our crew um, and we appreciate everybody's attention to the issues of illegal cannabis and hemp um, in, in, um, on multiple fronts. So we are going to start here today. Um, part of our initial efforts were to develop three subcommittees to look at specific areas of concern. And we are going to start out our meeting today with reports from the chairs of those subcommittees. So, um, Representative Morgan, you have a subcommittee on cannabinoids. Would you like to tell us what's going on there? Well, wonderful. I'm so excited to get to go first. And uh, I, we did meet uh, on June 30th. Uh, kind of went into a couple topics um, and realize there's a lot more to talk about still. So brief summary, uh, some of the considerations from House Bill 3000, uh, the cannabinoid subcommittee uh, still needs to kind of address or the requirements is the changes to state law to support the regulation of intoxicating cannabis derived products and artificially derived cannabinoids. Uh, methods to prevent sales to minors of industrial hemp commodities or products that contain intoxicating in cannabinoids, testing requirements and methods of enforcement of testing requirements for cannabinoids, including artificially derived cannabinoids to protect the public health and safety. So in the first meeting, we talked a lot about uh, labeling requirements for how hemp products are sold uh, in the general marketplace where you can currently go and in any kind of place buy a product and it just says hemp. You don't know what that means. You don't know if there's intoxicants. You don't know what the levels of that are. Uh, and there's currently no hemp specific standards for labeling. Uh, and the labels are not required to specify if there's THC or CBD content. Uh, and also just essentially some of them simply say it's below 0.3% THC, but based on the weight of the product, uh, that could be a significant amount of THC. And, and so there has to be 
relevance to how the levels of THC per serving are indicated. There was general agreement that it's important for consumers to be able to know how much THC they are consuming and, and so that the labeling has to be appropriate in that. We discussed testing of hemp items uh, and the concern uh, that was brought up from some of the subcommittee members is that compliance testing for hemp products has been required by law for several years, but it's not clear to what extent businesses are complying with these requirements. Uh, and we really were looking for ODA to be able to um, give us uh, an update on when the testing changes from House Bill 3000 will be put into place. So that's something we're looking for in our next meeting uh, or soon. Uh, we also discussed unlicensed segments of the hemp market at length. Some concerns about labeling and testing of hemp products from unlicensed sources. Um, but the full task force um, really has to kind of look at the regulatory structure of Oregon. And there are some discussion points that we know as a full task force we have to talk about. Uh, the lack of licensure for a secondary manufacturer to purchase hemp extract and process it into consumer products. So uh, there's licensing for the person growing, but not the second processor who processes it and goes to market. And so uh, that that level of licensure. So there's a standard and um, uh, basically accountability. Also import and wholesaling of extracts and products and retail sale of hemp products that are not currently subject to any licensing requirements whatsoever. So if the product comes in from another state, uh, are they under the same requirements of standards that our hemp products in, in Oregon have grown and so that was one of the topics for, uh, that came up that needs to be discussed at a whole level. I mean, a whole task force level. Uh, then we also uh, just a couple more almost done for you guys. Uh, you know, how do you s briefly discuss a two hour presentation? Uh, so we talked about tracking and tracing and the benefits and complications of a track and trace system. Um, some of the questions that we know we need to discuss in future conversations. In the context of import, export, wholesaler transactions, legal hemp and illicit cannabis are often visually indistinguishable. And so would or could a track and trace system help legal businesses and law enforcement? Uh, and in the context of consumer products, would a track and trace system uh, support trying um, basically tying laboratory results to the specific batch of materials so consumers can have the confidence that the label correctly reflects the contents of the products they're purchasing. So you can you can scan the product at market and see it all the way back to what batch that came from from the grower and you have accountability of of how that happened there. So uh, and then we discussed artificially derived cannabis items. Uh, but we'll need to have further conversations in upcoming meetings with a deeper dive into whether or not the current OLCC regulations are adequate. Currently, OLCC rules prohibit synthetic derivatives in products that are generally or, uh, that go to general market. Uh, there's a limited path for non-intoxicating synthetic derivatives in the uh, more heavily regulated adult use, adult use market. And some members express interest in having a safe regulated market for Oregon made Delta 8 THC. Uh, but unclear what regulations could support even a limited concept of safety for these synthetic derivatives. So that's a topic yet to fully vet out as well. So there was general agreement that uh, for current and future regulations, effective implementation depends on regulatory authority and resources uh, and considering the enforcement uh, resources for any new recommendations as well as existing regulations. So testing requirements prohibit uh, prohibition of intoxicant sales to minors. Are we at capacity with staffing levels? Are we able to do more? Who is that right body to do it? What's the capacity? So those are um, that's kind of the update of what we discussed in the first meeting. Sounds like it was a very substantive first meeting. Yeah, brain overload. <laughs> Thank you. You have a big agenda for that subcommittee. I appreciate it. I'm Senator Brzezinski. I believe you have the law enforcement subcommittee. Do you have anything you want to share? Yeah, thank you very much. We met yesterday as our second meeting. Uh, basically, what we're now focusing on is how can we help facilitate law enforcement when they are executing warrants. And so yesterday we went through uh, two topic areas as to clarification of statutes 
that we may want to and more than likely will be bringing forward as uh, quick fixes and clarification to ensure that we will in fact have uniformity across the state and having the ability to execute uh, warrants on multi counties uh, and who would have the authority. So we're looking at uh, uh, when these warrants are in fact being executed, who can be on the property with law enforcement uh, and there needs clarification there, as you can imagine, uh, depending on what they come up with, they need different expertise from different uh, uh, agencies ex uh, to provide them with information and knowledge as they're executing the warrant. So you expect to that statute. And the other one is just the authority that uh, uh, judicial uh, or our judges have uh, across county lines. So those are the two areas that we focused on, and I'm happy that uh, uh, Rob Bovet has now uh, joined us for today's meeting. He was with us yesterday. Uh, fortunately for us, unfortunately for him, he had to leave early. So when he left early, we have now volunteered him to do a lot of the drafting of this. So Rob, thank you very much for being a, a team player. And uh, I know that Michael will be reaching out to you and in all seriousness, uh, you know, I have Rob doing this work because Rob is, and I have worked uh, many years together in uh, trying to clarify uh, legisl uh, statutes, and he will be our go-to person uh, to work with Legislative Council. So that's a quick overview. There will be other areas that we will be looking at for law enforcement that we put together as to uh, uh, subjects and topics that we want, uh, including how do we ensure uh, that we have adequate uh, uh, numbers in law enforcement to execute such warrants and also ensuring that we uh, are able to identify plants in the sense of are they hemp or are they uh, cannabis? And, and so that means we need to be able to have uh, testing uh, as we're seeing these uh, uh, warrants being issued and executed. So that's a, a quick uh, thumbnail uh, over what we've done so far. And you you can expect more in the same area, and we are still looking at other uh, potential subject matter for the subcommittee to take up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Thank you, Senator. So I am convening the Water and Natural Resources Subcommittee. Um, we have had two meetings. The first meeting was really reviewing um, the changes to to water practice um, that were implemented through House Bill 4061. You remember we had a short session, so we're still trying to see how that's unrolling and what, what it might add up to. Um, and then today we had a presentation from Department of Justice regarding environmental crimes because our group was interested in whether or not we need to beef up the whole avenue of enforcement around um, environmental degradation. So we're trying to understand what's on the books now, what its application might be for can illegal hemp and cannabis operations, um, what changes you could make that would make it more appropriate to use that that those statutes um, for this specific purpose and not at the same time disrupt or interrupt the application of the Environmental Crimes Act to other situations. So um, it's a very interesting realm. I'm not sure where it's going to lead uh, if to any kind of recommendations, but we are doing we are doing the deep work. So thank you. With that, um, sounds like the subcommittees are all um, tackling big subjects that are would be difficult for us to take on in a group as a whole. So much appreciation to the members of those subcommittees. If there is anybody listening who would still like to join a subcommittee, I think you're, all you need to do is to contact um, Amanda and she will make sure that you get directed to the right subcommittee. Um, with that, I want to turn to reports from the field. This is a uh, going to be an item that we have on all of our agendas because we're trying to make rules and address a situation that may be changing out there even as we're in the midst of the um, illegal cannabis season. So we want to always give an opportunity for any observations from the field that would inform our um, decision making or the issues that are important to us. So is there anybody on the subcommittee who has anything that they'd like to share in terms of what you're seeing out there unrolling? Sheriff Sickler, I'll just call on you because you're you're probably the preeminent member of our task force who's actually seeing this up front and close. Do you have anything, any observations? 
Um, <clears throat> well, the season started um, in a, a much better place than it did last year, mm -hmm. uh, but we have seen quite a bit of work pop up in the last uh, three to four weeks. So our teams are really busy, um, both in our county and Joe County. Um, and then the state police can give you an update as well, uh, Sergeant Bechtel. But yeah, it was just uh, more work than we can get at right now. Uh, teams are working hard. We did, I think, two or even three search warrants this, this past week. Uh, seized uh, greenhouses full of marijuana, guns, cash. Um, had a pretty um, close incident yesterday. We almost had a shooting. So it was uh, with, a, I think, maybe a potential cartel. Uh, related grow. Anyways, so it's busy. The guys are out there uh, doing the work we can get at right now for sure. Okay, thank you. Anybody else wants to add anything from out there on the ground? If not, um, thank you, Sheriff. We'll depend on you and others to just keep us informed as we go along here. Um, Brent Kenyon, I see your hand. Do you have a quick comment? Yeah, I just want to thank the sheriff for his hard work. I know they've been out there really in the trenches trying to get this stuff done. And it, it is making a difference um, talking to a lot of, I think, some of the keys for us in the industry that we can talk to are people that supply products for these folks, so growing products, um, lumber, that kind of stuff. And we've seen a dramatic reduction in the amount of products being purchased, people coming in and buying tens of thousands of dollars of nutrients and things like that. So I think there has been a, a, a serious impact in, in the overall size of the problem, but there's definitely still um, a lot more hidden gardens. I think they have their work cut out for them. It's not along the roadside like it was <clears throat> last year. So they're really having to hunt them down. But I just wanted to thank them for their work. I know they've been after it um, really hard and uh, it is making a difference. Unfortunately, I think the market could be in a much better place, but it seems to be kind of a nationwide decline in cannabis sales um, looking at other states. And so I don't think it's just Oregon feeling the pain but um you know we've got a lot a lot of work to do for sure uh, i think people are plugging in there trying to hang in their licensees that are feeling the backside of the wave so we're hoping for a, a better season after this harvest and and uh, their work is so important to help that happen so thank you thank you brent and i'm just going to add an editorial comment the fact that we are seeing some impact from the work is really an argument for continuing that discussion around funding um because we we don't we cannot assume um, that we are uh, we're going to see an end to this unless we continue to invest in it. Um, Tyler. Thank you, Chair Marsh. I just wanted to uh, uh, give a my report from the field. Uh, my team for the first time uh, since legalization is fully staffed, which is uh, three detectives for the Northwest region marijuana team. Uh, we are facing uh, probably about our busiest week uh, ever next week. Uh, and we just wrapped up the uh, Oregon Narcotics Enforcement Association conference uh, yesterday. Um, so I had an opportunity to talk to a lot of bit different uh, uh, narcotics teams, and I can kind of just anecdotally uh, let the committee know that um, while uh, a lot of teams are starting to work more marijuana cases, I, I rarely found a team that was fully staffed and not strapped for people and uh, focus remains uh, fentanyl. Staff. So um, uh, there the, a lot of a lot of the task force teams, a lot of the county teams, their focus um, uh, is is elsewhere and probably rightfully so. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all for the reports. We'll continue to depend upon uh, you to tell us what's going on out there. Uh, so I'm going to move now to the main item on our agenda today. One of the issues when we um, considered our subcommittee structure, um, one of the issues that we assigned to the committee of, as a whole was the overall regulatory structure of hemp and cannabis. As we know now, we have two significant agencies and ODA and OLCC that are involved in respectively hemp and um, cannabis, legal cannabis. Um, and one of the questions that can, can consistently comes up is whether or not we have appropriately delegated responsibilities for um, the regulation of those products to, to those agencies. So today we're gonna open up a discussion about just exactly that, um, with the idea of first accumulating some understanding 
of what the regulatory system does look like today. And then we're going to draw in some experts who have been kind enough to be here with us today to give us some additional information and their perspective. So Amanda, I think you and Sunny have the first piece of this. We understand what the current structure of regulation is. Yep, we do. And um, if it's helpful, I can go ahead and share my screen um, with the agenda. We sent out a document and we'll just go ahead and pull that up here in a second. All right, so can everybody see that? Can you make it bigger? It's pretty fuzzy from my okay. perspective. Okay, let me see here. Yeah, much that better. Helps? Yeah, that's good. Okay. So um, Sunny and I put this table together hoping to have kind of um, a quick way to look at the way things are regulated right now. And so you can see the first column is OLCC licensees. So those would be producers, processors, wholesalers, retailers, and then um, the testing labs. And then the next column over, we have ODA licensees, which are the growers and the primary handlers. And then we have the unlicensed hemp, which is the legal hemp that just doesn't hold a license from um, the ODA. And then the last column would be illegal. So it would be either marijuana or hemp that's growing illegally manufacturing or distribution of illegal cannabis. And so we've got we've went ahead and kind of laid out here where the regulatory authority exists. And then sometimes if it's questionable or not there at all, we have the X to notate that. So for an example, the secondary processors um, don't have a license currently with ODA, but they're planning on putting those rules in effect in 2023 based on the changes in House Bill 3000. And they do still have testing <clears throat> and um, testing requirements that ODA enforces, as well as uh, serving size and container size regulations that OLCC put into place that went into effect July 1st of this year, so a mm, couple weeks ago. And I would note, we didn't leave you you out on purpose, Andre, um, but we we just kind of focused on the the big stuff and didn't address the medical marijuana program in this table. OK, I was wondering, but I can certainly answer any questions uh, folks may have about uh, OHA's roles. Perfect. And just as a reminder to everybody as well, there is a uh, private home grow allowance of four cannabis plants at a private residence, uh, be it hemp or marijuana. Great. Um, uh, Amanda, are you going to walk us through um, this chart? Um, we can more in depth if there's any areas where people have um, questions, um, maybe if something, um, any of the columns you think maybe to be changed. Okay, so let's ask the group. First, does everybody have agreement that this is their understanding of the system? Are there any, any questions or challenges about what's presented here? So why don't you address the areas in which there starts to be, like in the second column, where there starts to be engagement of, we've got OLCC licensees, we've got ODA licensees, and then we've got, um, which are largely separate as we begin, but as you go, as you move down to other kinds of activities, you start to see some engagement of OLCC in the ODA realm. Why don't you just yes. walk us through how that works? Yeah, so I think that one of the first ones that we see are the sales to minors. So House Bill 3000 um, gave OLCC the authority to set the limits of um, THC items in the general market that minors can purchase. So OLCC sets those limits um, for both hemp licensees and then also the unlicensed hemp businesses. 
Um, and so there is some question about like where the authority lies there if somebody was selling to minors. Um, but we still would need to work through on that. Um, OLCC also sets the general concentration limits for hemp items um, sold in the general market. Um, and that was also House Bill 3000 change. Um, the um, testing. And if I, if I could yeah, jump in real quick, Amanda. Um, and those are a per serving and per container, whereas ODA has the authority of nothing above 0.3% THC. Um, so there is some overlapping authority there as well. Yeah, good point, Sunny. Um, testing as for all of the licensees, um, OHA writes the testing rules um, and then ODA references them for the hemp testing so that it matches the marijuana testing. So like we've talked about for the unlicensed hemp businesses, they're required by statute to be following the same testing rules that both the ODA licensees follow and then also the OLCC um, marijuana licensees follow. Um, another change from legislation recently was um, a requirement that hemp vape items are tested and packaged and labeled in the same way that marijuana vapes are. And so they have to have packaging and labeling, um, but other hemp items in the general marketplace are not required to have any special packaging and labeling. So it's only those hemp items that fall under that um, OLCC authority for that. Um, the import and export, um, if there's issues with that, we think that generally falls with law enforcement. Um, food safety is an ODA activity, um, same as pesticide use. And then the last column is taxes. Um, the only businesses that are taxed for like the state per when you a consumer purchase something would be the OLCC licensees. And then why don't you just walk us through in a similar way the unlicensed hemp column? Because okay. I think that's a that's a confusing realm. It is, yes. Um, so this would be the legal hemp businesses that just don't require a license from anybody. So um, growing and processing, those don't primary processing, they obviously have a license from ODA. Um, secondary processors are going to be the new rules in 2023 for licensing by ODA. Um, sales to consumers, so the CBD stores that you see around town don't actually have licenses, but ODA does have authority over those stores. And maybe Sunny can go into a little bit more detail on that. Yeah, yeah so previous, previous to House Bill 3000, ODA only had statutory authority to license growers and handlers, which is that primary processing. <clears throat> so following House Bill 3000, we do have authority if if we chose as a state to, to license retail stores. Um, but what we do have authority over in regard to retail stores is making sure that they're not selling products that are above 0.3 and products that meet the testing requirements. So that's where our primary authority at ODA lies within Thanks, the hemp man. program yeah and then um the sales to minors is the same for both the licensees and the general we believe that there is some shared authority over that in the general marketplace um in the general marketplace we also olcc was at those um concentration limits like i said before the per package um per serving thc limits and then oda has the 0.3 percent requirement um, the testing is required by statute, but they're not, like I said, not licensed by anybody, so it's unclear how much of that testing is happening. Um, packaging and labeling is the same. It's only those hemp vape items that fall under the packaging and labeling requirements from OLCC. And then um, food safety and pesticide use would be still, again, uh, Department of Agriculture. Does, um, is there any other similar realm in which ODA has a responsibility for a product in a store? Not for a food product. I mean, like our, our pesticide program regulates 
the sales of pesticides and they have to be in the original unopened container and have to be registered in the state. Um, Lauren, I don't know if you can think of any others that. Yeah, there, yeah there's a few others. Uh, uh, fertilizers, uh, feed products. That's about what's it, what's in the bag or what's like what's on the label should be actually in the bag. It's it's about that. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a few things. It seems like a hemp product though puts you in a whole different realm of stores. And I mean, fertilized. Those are the the products that you've described so far are generally sold in stores that have an agricultural um, relationship, whereas a, a hemp product could be sold in the food co-op in the I mean in the minute market. Yeah, I mean, so when you're thinking of pesticides, you have to um, maybe broaden your yeah. uh, understanding of the definition because disinfectant wipes, Lysol spray, mm. those are all pesticides as well. Um, you know, fertilizers, you know, plant food for your indoor house plants. So we do have a, a pretty broad scale when it comes to that. So for example, our pesticide and fertilizer staff try to go to like the Fred Meyer distribution center because <clears throat> we want to get it because it goes out to all the various retail stores. Um, but yeah, from a, from a food perspective, we're in there looking at uh, basic sanitation, not at necessarily what products are being offered for sale on the, on the shelf. And we'll have Rusty later from our food safety program. Representative Marsh, I think, and I'm sorry, my camera won't turn on again. Um, I, we're in most, you're, you're right. Uh, um, being in those retail stores for the purpose that we're there is a, is a little different, not unusual, but a little different. We're already in most, most of those retail places with our weights and measures program for their scale certifications. Mm -hmm. So we do have a touch point there, but it's not, it's not for a product purpose. It's for a, a consumer purpose um, more so. So. Got it. Um, questions from the committee, Brent. Oh, I was going to say I was confirming. I think Department of Ag, Sonny, tell me if I'm wrong, has some um, oversight over seafood type products. Is that not right? Yeah. Between them and fish and wildlife are the two people that I have to account to for the fresh seafood I sell out of my market, for instance. But I, I actually was just kind of so Amanda that the chart we were looking at before is pretty much how it's existing, not necessarily proposed. I just see the import export. I don't think law enforcement really has any tune in to what's being shipped out as far as secondary um, hemp products, correct? I mean, nobody's really looking at that right now. Is that right? Yeah, I think the concept was like, if there was an issue, like who, you know, like if, for who example, deal with it? yeah, well, and, and, we, can, and Brent, we can change it too. Um, I get calls or emails from the postal shipping folks up in Portland on a pretty regular basis. Um, I know that OSP works with the Port of Portland through the airport. Um, so it's really about <clears throat> our people trying to take suitcases of green plant material out of the, right. the Port of Portland. Um, a lot of the, the postal packages are, again, some of it's dried plant material, but some a lot of it is uh, processed material or concentrate um, that folks are trying to ship. So that import export is really primarily around THC levels and what is or isn't legal. All right. Well, definitely, I think we need to get to the point where we have you know, some idea what kind of products are being manufactured locally and, and shipped out. But I'm just curious if that's where we were sitting right now. So that makes sense. Oh, Sheriff Sickler. Yeah, I was just going to comment. <clears throat> we do do a lot of work around parcel interdiction uh, when we have the opportunities. There is a lot being shipped out in various uh, through various means, whether that's the UPS, FedEx, mail, other you know click and ship type places. There's there's a substantial amount of product going out and money coming in. Other questions about the current structure as presented.
Okay, great. Thank you, Amanda and Sunny, for that very concise summary in the chart, which I think we'll probably be referring back to on a regular basis. Um, so our next presenter today is Matthew Grisbo, who is the executive director of the Cannabis Regulatory Agency in Michigan. And we um, asked the director, Grisbo, to come um, present to us just to give us another idea of how other states have grappled with some of these issues, how they're sorting it out, whether there are trying to figure out whether there might be lessons for us from other places. So, director, are you here? I am here. Great. Please take it away. Great. Well, good morning to you. Good afternoon for Michigan. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come speak to you all. Uh, happy to uh, share our experience and, and help you in your uh, pathway of figuring out what to do in this wonderful world of cannabis. Uh, a little bit of level setting, and I actually created a chart similar to what Amanda did there, so you can see comparatively how we do things in Michigan. Uh, we've had medical marijuana in Michigan since 2008. That was the creation of our uh, patient and caregiver registry program. Uh, there was no commercialization at that point, but just home grow either individually for patients or through a designated caregiver. We have fairly liberal allowances in Michigan, allowing 12 plants to be grown at home by any patient, uh, and a caregiver can provide those services for up to five patients. So a maximum on the medical side of 72 plants that can be grown at home here in Michigan. Uh, in 2014, we enacted the Industrial Hemp Research and Development Act. Uh, that predated the 2018 Farm Bill, obviously. So in the four years between that law passing and the federal farm bill legalizing hemp federally, there really was not much of any activity in the industrial hemp space in Michigan. In 2016, we passed the Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing Act, which created the commercial system for medical marijuana in the state of Michigan and led to us licensing through our agency, uh, growers, processors, provisioning centers, safety compliance facilities, and secure transporters. Uh, 2018, a ballot initiative that legalized adult use in Michigan, allowed for adults over 21 to grow up to 12 plants at home, uh, and also created the commercial system on the adult use side, which is very similar in structure to that on the medical side. Uh, in 2020, uh, enacted the Industrial Hemp Growers Act. Uh, this uh, allowed our Department of Agriculture to start licensing industrial hemp growers uh, strictly on that agricultural side. Uh, pulled it out of that Research and Development Act and created a more commercial structure for the growers in the industrial hemp space. And then in 2021, uh, we amended our definitions of uh, marijuana and industrial hemp, which is all in that uh, 2018 uh, citizen initiated law now uh, to include uh, more than just the 0.3% THC in distinguishing industrial hemp from marijuana, uh, now includes the total THC uh, of all uh, isomers of THC as well as THCA. Uh, had a lot of back and forth with the state of Oregon doing something similar to what's been happening there and trying to create those distinctions. Uh, and also gave our agency the authority to set a THC limit on hemp derived products beyond the 0.3%. Uh, we're in the process of, of adopting rules to do that, uh, intending to set the limit uh, at one milligram per serving and 10 milligrams per package uh, for consumer products uh, beyond that 0.3%. Uh, and then in 2022, just earlier this year, there was an executive reorganization order that transferred the authority over everything post agriculture and hemp to our agency as well. Uh, so our agency now will be responsible for the registry program for patients and caregivers, as well as commercial operations for medical marijuana, adult use marijuana, and uh, for uh, industrial hemp uh, processing and sales as well. What we intend to do with that is, is look at a legislative approach. Uh, as I mentioned, our Department of Agriculture created a separate act for hemp growing. Uh, we're looking to do something similar for hemp processing and sales as well, setting some standards uh, for uh, those processes as well as for consumer goods, particularly focused on those consumable products for which currently there really are no specific product regulations. Uh, it is possible uh, for businesses to be licensed as processor handlers under that research act that was enacted in 2014, but there really are specific uh, consumer protection mechanisms within that act. Uh, so that's something that we're looking to do. Um, one, one quick distinction you'll see in the chart I'm about to share. We do not have any authorized home grow of hemp. 
Uh, as I mentioned, we can grow quite a few plants uh, here in Michigan, marijuana plants at home, but you have to have a license through our Department of Agriculture to grow hemp. So sort of an odd distinction there. Uh, and in Michigan, we have a fairly broad unregulated market. Uh, I say unregulated to mean both legal activities as well as truly illicit activities. Uh, but our prolific allowance for home growth certainly has led to a, a gray market that is fairly sizable. Uh, it, it is diminishing over time as commercial production and availability of products through regulated businesses has become more widely available. Uh, so for comparison's sake here, I'll share this uh, chart, if you all can see that now. Um, kind of set that up the same way that Amanda did. If I can make that a little bigger, I can try. Oh, I might have made it too big. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is uh, the, the Cannabis Regulatory Agency. That's the agency I lead. Uh, we license everything in terms of growing, processing, and sales on the marijuana side of things, including testing and packaging and labeling standards. Uh, we do rely on our partners in law enforcement for any issues with import and export of marijuana. Uh, if food safety, uh, pesticide use is all governed through our agency, though we work closely with our Department of Agriculture to adopt those standards uh, and actually have a memo of understanding where they assist us with the inspection of processors who make uh, infused uh, products that are meant for human consumption. And then our Department of Treasury is responsible for tax collection. On the agricultural side, as I mentioned, growing is, is licensed through our Department of Agriculture. Uh, and now just very recently, all other things, including sales and processing are within our agency's authority. Uh, there has not been much in the way of oversight of sales in the hemp space within this market. Uh, as I mentioned, we're trying to work on some legislative changes that would grant broader authority and really focus on setting standards for consumer products. Um, the THC limits, as I mentioned, our Department of Agriculture enforces on the hemp side, so they do the, the post-harvest testing uh, of all hemp products, uh, all hemp crops, I should say, but we do define uh, through our rules at our agency the uh, total amount of THC that can be present in consumer products. Um, we do not have any specific hemp taxes. I wanted to be clear about that here. Uh, we do have a sales tax that applies to hemp-derived products, but not uh, a specific tax. Uh, Unlicensed hemp, there really is nothing legal in the hemp space in Michigan that's not uh, within the regulated system, uh, though I should be clear, we do not in any way prohibit or restrict interstate commerce in the hemp space. There just really are no standards at this point for sales of those products. And then we work co closely with law enforcement partners on any illegal, illegal cannabis operations. Our agency, uh, through our fee structure, does fund a uh, marijuana tobacco investigation section in our state police that we with whom we coordinate any sort of illicit activities that are reported to the agency that may have an overlap with our regulated space or just truly illicit activity we send over through uh, the Department of State Police. That is my summary, but I'm happy to take any questions the panel may have. Thank you again. Thank you so much for being here. I'm sure we will have questions. Could you start us off by just describing a little bit about what the conversation was that led to the um, the regulatory change that you just made in 2022, the post agricultural shift to the cannabis agency? Yes, certainly. Uh, so we had uh, created a great partnership with our Department of Agriculture uh, in the years leading up to and just after uh, legalization, particularly on the adult use side, as we wanted to adopt food safety standards that our Department of Agriculture uh, had the expertise in uh, on the marijuana side. And that led to that memo of understanding. Uh, in building that relationship, uh, the Department of Ag uh, had understood that once they get got past implementing the Industrial Hemp Growers Act, they needed to turn their attention to processing and consumer goods. And they were leaning heavily on us to create essentially what we determined to be a very similar infrastructure and area of expertise that already existed within our agency. Uh, so we made the decision as we started to see more and more intersectional issues between hemp and marijuana, uh, particularly as Delta 8 became prevalent and we were looking at statutory changes related to that, that it just made more sense to incorporate that within our structure. Uh, our Department of Agriculture had just a few staff. They were very good on the agricultural policy side and had a small team that was doing the testing as well. And they have an, in, an in-house lab. Uh, they did not have uh, field agents conducting investigations and they didn't have an adjudication team, uh, which our agency did. And that was gonna be sort of critical for the, those functions uh, of regulating uh, the consumer goods and retail side. 
ultimately persuaded our governor's office to uh, enact that executive order to just transfer that authority to our agency. Thank you. And they continue to, to do testing, though. Is that, can you clarify that? Yeah. Correct. They, they still do the testing at the state lab for uh, hemp harvests. Uh, mm -hmm. There is authority for that to be done at the labs that our agency licenses, uh, but that hasn't been necessary to this point as the agriculture lab has been able to, to have the bandwidth to handle all that testing on their own. Great. Thank you. And we have some questions. Senator Hansel. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a uh, question I have, being a border uh, state with Canada, do you have any unique uh, situations there uh, with the cannabis or hemp issues uh, across borders? So, so we do have some, uh, certainly, uh, mostly, and this is somewhat anecdotal, uh, the Customs and Border Patrol does occasionally seize uh, marijuana shipments that are trying to make their way across the border from Canada. Uh, we suspect the majority of that is not destined for Michigan, but simply passing through to other Midwestern states where there is less access, uh, where marijuana is, is fetching a significantly higher value. Uh, we've tried to coordinate some operations through our Department of State Police, but, but have not really engaged in that to this point yet. Courtney Moran. Hi, Andrew. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, I have a couple questions. So one I wanted to ask about the delineation between grain fiber and cannabinoids and how is this specifically only for cannabinoids? Do you work with grain and fiber? Do grain and fiber products remain with Department of Agriculture or what is that framework? All of that will fall within our agency's authority or does now. Uh, we do not have any specific distinctions on any type of hemp derived product at this point. Uh, the legislation that we're pursuing would really focus on the consumable products, uh, recognizing that there's there's no real real uh, impact on health, safety, and welfare for grain and fiber type products. Okay, thank you. And then, so you're saying that you're working on language right now for product regulation, or where does that stand? We've had conversations with legislators. Uh, there was a bill package that was already in play when the shift in authority occurred that was specifically focused on changing definitions of adulterated food to say that uh, hemp infused consumable products were not adulterated by definition. However, that creates a challenging conflict with uh, federal law and how that's been interpreted there. And our Department of Agriculture also has a responsibility for implementing and overseeing the food law. Uh, the way in which we attempt to, to approach that is, is to massage that legislative package so that we would simply indicate that hemp infused consumable products are not food by definition and fall within the purview of the agency and the standards we set. Uh, that's also how we handle marijuana infused edible products, which also by definition would be adulterated food as cannabis is not an approved food ingredient, uh, particularly considering that the FDA's posturing has been that CBD is an active drug ingredient, uh, which would then never really be per permissible as, as, a, as a food ingredient or a food product. Uh, so we would simply remove it from sort of the food system and define it separately and set the standards separately, adopting you know, similar standards for health, safety, and welfare that are present in, in food products. And with this, this would be for products other than the graph approved hemp ingredients. Is correct. correct. Okay. Thanks. Jeff Sickler. Yeah, I was just curious. Do you have a significant problem with black market uh, marijuana and like a, a lot of crime associated with it in Michigan, or is it pretty benign? Uh, I, I don't think it's been completely diminished. Uh, some some evidence we've seen is that the uh, our our rate of capture is relatively high. I think comparable to the state of Oregon, uh, that we do lag a bit behind uh, Colorado and Washington, uh, but doing better than other similarly situated states that legalized around the same time. So at about 56 percent of the market is within the regulated space in 2021, based on one economic analysis that I've read. Uh, the the market in Michigan for marijuana is about three billion dollars, based on several market analyses. And this year we'll have a little over two billion in sales, so the majority of the activity is happening there, but certainly still a significant amount outside of that. Um, it's it's really uh, I don't think that we have uh, 
I heard some references to to uh, cartel and organized crime operations. We do see some of that in Michigan, uh, but I think the majority of our of our unregulated market is supported by individuals who are legally producing within our very very sort of liberal limits. Uh, though technically are breaking the law when they sell those products outside of that. But it's a very challenging enforcement because it's legal to produce. It's legal for the person that has it to possess it. So you really have to catch that transaction to say they're doing something that's not allowed. Uh, so we see quite a bit of that. And the majority of the concern I hear from municipal officials and local law enforcement agencies around the state are related to that proliferation of home grows. Uh, we do see small organizations who are buying up houses, gutting them and turning them into grow operations. Uh, but it, it uh, frankly has not been as, as big an issue as I thought it might be. And we see it more prevalent in areas of the state where they don't allow commercial marijuana operations because there is local control in Michigan. Uh, so we have a couple of counties that are pretty densely populated where there are no legal uh, commercial operations at all. And we see a lot of those concerns about home grow uh, and the um, quasi legal or illegal activities happening there. In, in that same vein, did you see any bump in illegal operations when um, you passed the Hemp Act in 2020? Uh, no, I, I don't believe so. We, we did see a significant, significant increase in the number of uh, hemp licensees. Uh, it, it was around the same time that we started to see Delta 8 concerns, but I think the majority of those products were coming in from out of state. Any other questions from members of the committee about what's going on in Michigan? We have a great expert here. <clears throat> okay, Andrew, oh, Jake Johnstone. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair Marsh. Um, I would just had a question more about, uh, you know, water law and environmental impacts associated with cannabis industry in your state and wondering if you find uh, that's a pretty big pressing issue or if it's just a non-issue uh, when it comes to both the registered and unregistered cannabis in your state. Thanks. Sure, it, it, it has been a bit of an issue. Uh, we partnered uh, on several um, uh, of those fronts with our Department of uh, Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, as well as with energy providers in Michigan. We saw We've, we've seen a number of public safety concerns raised with home grow. Uh, so individuals, there, there is some water theft occurring there, but the bigger concern was individuals who are setting up home grow operations. Again, you can grow in theory as many as 84 plants uh, within, within a home if you're over 21 and you're a caregiver. That's a lot of plants to put in a house and certainly it exceeds the energy capacity uh, of what a house is typically wired for. Um, so we'd, we'd had concerns raised by uh, first responders uh, as well as law enforcement in some areas of the state. So we partnered with a lot of different groups to put out some education about the need to engage with your energy provider before setting up those home grows. Uh, on the commercial side, we've recently started to engage on several sustainability topics. Uh, one of which is is water use as well as electricity and, and air impacts and, and so forth, um, as well as waste. Uh, we have recently started to focus on education about wastewater as we found many of our licensees were not appropriately engaging with uh, wastewater consultants before they tied into the water system and we're doing things that technically are not permitted. We've taken more of an educational approach uh, to try and get people into compliance versus taking disciplinary action. Uh, but it's one of those issues that the industry is growing so quickly and with the you know many concerns about illegal operations and compliance and, and market structures, uh, those things are really just starting to get to the forefront now a couple of years in. Thank you. Any other questions? So Andrew, thank you so much for being um, with us. It's really helpful to hear how other states are negotiating some of these issues and, and the collision between hemp and cannabis. Um, so thank you. Um, and we may have more questions for you as we go along. So I appreciate you being here. Um, our next presenter is from the National Industrial Hemp Council, Patrick Atagi, who is president and CEO. And Patrick, I apologize if I have butchered your name but we are very glad to have you here. You know, I do not see him on the line quite yet. I think he was planning on joining around 11. 
Okay. So we may have jumped um, again a little bit. Um, do you um, want to go to wine next? Yeah. Is Kelly here? She is. Kelly and Rusty. Okay. We thought it would be helpful to understand as a parallel, possible parallel structure, how Oregon regulates wine, since it's also an agricultural product, but at some point veers into a different kind of product and, and regulation by the OLCC. So we have asked Kelly Rout from the OLCC and Rusty Rock from ODA to talk about that structure and any kind of lessons we might learn from that for uh, hemp and cannabis. So Kelly and Rusty. Great, um, I'll kick it off. Um, good morning, Chair Marsh, uh, Vice Chair Morgan and members of the task force. My name is Kelly Rout. I'm, I'm with OLCC's policy team. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, wine regulation in Oregon. I do have a, a one page document that I will share just to sort of summarize what I'm going to go over. So I will be sharing that now. Hopefully that is up on your screen. Yep. Great. Um, go. Okay, so um, OLCC does not regulate grapes or other fruit grown in Oregon, uh, but we do regulate the production, distribution, and sale of alcoholic beverages made from that fruit. And alcoholic beverages um, are those that contain more than 0.5% alcohol by volume. Um, OLCC has two licenses that pertain specifically to wine. Um, that's the winery license and the grower sales privilege or GSP license. We'll start off with the winery license because that's the far more prevalent license. Obviously, Oregon is a very well-known um, wine making region. Um, and so a license is needed to produce wine for distribution or sale. Um, and a federal permit is required for any winery license. Now, winery licenses have sort of two flavors depending on who is making the wine. Um, you have sort of your traditional winery where the winery may be growing some or all of the grapes and then they have all the production facilities on site. They are making their own wine, bottling it, labeling it, um, and then selling it um, either through the distribution channels or selling directly to consumers. Um, there are also what we call custom crush licensees. These um, licensees do not make their own wine. Uh, they do not have a vineyard or um, any production facilities. Um, what they have is a written contract with an Oregon winery that has the um, appropriate federal permit to produce the wine. Um, and then the, the, the winery makes the wine, bottles it, labels it. The Custom Crush licensee owns the brand um, and they are able to you know, store it and then sell it through uh, whatever distribution channel they want. Um, I will also note that the, um, the winery license pertains to cider production. Um, and cider is defined as alcoholic beverages made from the fermentation of apples or pears uh, that contains not more than 8.5% um, alcohol by volume. Um, and we've issued, um, to date, we have currently over 1,100 issued winery licenses uh, in the state. Um, the second license is much less used. Um, and this is actually for... Um, basically for vineyards um, that grow grapes, but then they can sell the wine that is made from those grapes. And so this license provides the privilege to distribute or sell wine um, by the, the licensee who's usually the vineyard owner, but only if all of the grapes used to make the wine are grown in Oregon under the control of that licensee. Um, and so those grapes grown by the vineyard are sent to a winery for wine production, bottling and labeling. And then the, the vineyard owner um, gets that bottled labeled wine back and can sell it um, through distribution channels, uh, can sell it at their premises, they can sell it at special events, that type of thing. Um, and it also pertains to cider. So if a, an orchard, I guess, gets this license, um, they can also do that um, so long as all of the, the product, um, as long as the finished product was made from just um, their, their orig uh, originating items. Um, and then we've only issued 21 licenses in the state, so it's not widely used, um, but it's still there. And something, another area where OLCC touches grapes, so to speak, um, is that there is a tax on agricultural products used in a winery for making wine, um, and the tax is $25 per ton of grapes. Uh, this is sort of, um, and it, you know, locally called the tonnage tax. Um, that tax is split. Uh, evenly between the vineyard who grows the grapes and the winery who makes the wine. Um, and OLCC is involved in this because we collect the tax um, on behalf of the Oregon winery. 
And that was pretty much the, the high level overview that I have, but I'm happy to answer any other questions um, that you might have. Could I just ask a clarification question around the difference between the grower um, license and the winery license? Is that if I'm growing, but not making the wine on, but asking someone else to make the wine, and I still have the opportunity to sell that product that's made at, by a different entity? Is that, why would I, why would I seek that license? Oh, the grower sales privilege. I think yeah. if you um, are growing, you were, you're just a vineyard, but you don't want to engage in like all of the things used to make the wine. And sometimes uh, a lot of wineries, you know, will use grapes from other vineyards. But if I think if you want to have a product that's like, this is from my vineyard, I grow these grapes and I would like to um, be involved in the sale of this product, um, they can have someone else do it. Um, as long as, you know, as long as they, um, the, what all the grapes go into that, um, into those bottles and they're okay. not using grapes from any other vineyard. So I think it's just some, uh, it is like sort of a privilege. Like I grew the, I grew the grapes and now I get to, I sort of get to sell this product. Got it. Thank you. That's super helpful. Um, questions. And then we also have an opportunity for our ODA representative to chime in here from from their perspective, but let's take the questions that have popped up here. Senator Hansel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I was just curious, what type of revenue does that tonnage tax produce? Th that third bucket. You're on mute. Kelly, you're on mute. I, I just realized that, yeah. <laughs> Apologies. Um, I don't know offhand. Um, I don't know if Steve has an idea. But um, it's collected and it's passed on to the wine board for their purposes. Um, if I might, Senator Steve Marks, uh, for the record, I think it's somewhere south of two million, less than two million dollars produced by it. I just uh, commend to you that you know that system is not a very efficient system. I went into um, plaffer it onto anything else. It's kind of hunt and pack for us to figure out who's growing grapes uh, because of the way it, it's set up. And as you know, it came out of a fairly extensive uh, controversy about how we, what we should look at for what's going out of state and what's in state. Um, but I think it's a little less than 2 million. I'll get that actual number for you, sir. And Senator Hansel, uh, if, if I could just interject uh, Chair Marsh, um, think about the wine board as a commodity commission. That's the wine industry's version of a commodity commission, and it's their version of an assessment. It's it's a tax because it's it's alcohol wine, and so that's how they fund the commission. Um, and so they're they're like a commission, and I think you're familiar with that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yep. Brittany. Thank you. Yeah, Kelly, I just had a question about the licensing. So the grower sales privilege license, that's obtained directly from OLCC, but the winery license is obtained directly from the federal government or that's through OLCC, but from the feds. Um, thanks, Courtney. The, the, yes, the grower sales privilege is a license issued by OLCC. The winery license is also issued by OLCC, um, but in a as a condition of obtaining uh, an OLCC license, you need to also have a federal permit either to produce wine, uh, which we call a producer blender permit or um, a, uh, a wholesaler license. So I apologize that wasn't super clear, but you do absolutely have to have an OLCC license, but you also have to have um, the federal permit um, and, that, and all of the requirements that go along with, with federal permitting like taxes and things like that. And that federal permit's obtained directly from who exactly? Uh, the um, TTB, the Alcohol and Tax uh, Tobacco, yeah, TTB. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, Rusty. I think Senator Ansel has another question. Oh, Senator, please go ahead. Uh, just uh, just uh, more curiosity for me, when you have, you're able to put the estate label on it, uh, are you able to do that with either the privilege or um, I know it's a regular, but can you do an estate with the privilege uh, licensing? 
you follow what no, I'm saying? No, just because we don't have that many licensees who have the GSP. I know that for the, for those of you that um, aren't familiar at an estate, you can follow a, a wine with the estate if um, all of the grapes came from that particular premises. Um, and so I am not, to, you know, it's possible. The thing is, so the other, the winery is making the wine um, and the grapes didn't come from their premises. It came from another vineyard. Um, possible though that would actually fall under like federal labeling requirements which i'm not you know 100 percent familiar with so it's possible but um and if you'd like me to look into that i'd happy to and reach out to you see if that's done. Yeah. Um, thank you uh rusty um you want to chime in here from oda's perspective in terms of how the uh, responsibilities for grapes and wine are shared Sure. Thank you, uh, Chair Marsh, uh, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Rusty Rock. I'm the program area director for the uh, Department of Agriculture's Food Safety and Animal Health programs. Uh, and I was going to talk a little bit about how the ODA's food safety program uh, regulates wineries uh, in, the, in the context of the conversation. In the definition in ORF 616, uh, food is defined as as articles used for food and or drink, including ice for human consumption or food for dog and cats. So that that definition encompasses uh, wine as it's a as a beverage or a drink. So uh, we license all wineries in the state as food processors uh, within the food safety program. So that that's where our engagement begins when they start making an actual beverage or uh, the drink itself. And uh, the scope of our uh, assessments to start the licensing process really is around uh, the sanitation and food safety aspects, uh, looking at it as a food or food ingredient, uh, which primarily it's a standalone food. It's not generally an ingredient when you're talking about wine. Uh, we're looking at physical facilities, sanitary facilities, uh, and process controls. And when I say sanitary facilities and, and physical facilities, we're really supplementary to the, the plumbing code. So we like to get involved as early as possible to look at the construction of the building, making sure that the floors, walls, ceilings are all smooth, tight, easily cleanable, making sure there's adequate facilities for hand washing, for wear washing, uh, that there's methods to exclude pests, uh, either flying or crawling, uh, and that the, the folks that are going to be operating facility have controls in place to ensure that uh, sanitary handling practices are being followed. So uh, the restrooms are in place that are adequate for the, the number of employees. Hand washing is taking place at uh, proper times. food processing waste and sanitary waste related to employee activities. And that that's kind of our role in a nutshell. We're, we're not generally looking at the labeling for wines. That's a, a TTB OLCC responsibility. So we, we stay out of that. Uh, and we do maintain a relationship with OLCC to help because uh, generally folks know when they're going to make wine that they need to contact OLCC and get appropriate licenses. Uh, so we monitor the, the licensing from OLCC that's uh, provided via email, and we will reach out to the wineries and uh, help them realize there's an additional step in the process. And what, would what, what would happen if what was being produced was grape juice? Uh, thanks for that question, Chair Marsh. Uh, if it's a grape juice, it wouldn't fall under uh, the OLCC winery uh, scope. That would be fall under it's just a, a standard drink. So we would basically handle that one from uh, start to finish. The, we have some specific regulations related to juice because there's been outbreaks historically. Uh, if you think back to the Odwalla situation several years ago with E. coli, so juice has some very specific food safety controls, but facility wise, all the requirements are the same. We don't have any different requirements for a, a winery versus a, a juice manufacturer. Uh, there are additional uh, process controls that are required for a juice 
manufacturer because of the intended audience and uh, the need for pasteurization, which isn't necessarily required for a, a winery because of the fermentation process as a control that mitigates the risks. And just to further explore the, the parallel between the cannabis pro products and, um, and hemp products, there's no, I'm assuming, but you can tell me, it, in, in this world of wine and grapes, there's no kind of in-between product. I mean, people tell you that they're going to make grape juice or they tell you that they're going to make wine and we don't have to worry about the thing that's in between. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't think of any good examples of in between. We do have folks that will start out as a winery and then decide that they would like to do grape juice and not realize that there's additional complications associated with that. Uh, so when we're doing our inspections, uh, wineries are pretty low risk activity if they're just making wine. Uh, some wineries get pretty complicated with their food service, but I'm going to ignore that for now because it's not pertinent. Uh, but a straight up winery is a pretty low risk activity, so we may only go just to kind of go through and make sure everything is still running smoothly. Uh, and if we find that they've picked up additional activities like making a juice, then we would need to work with them on resolving that. But we typically will catch that actually at the uh, at the retail level where we monitor our responsibilities encompass the retail distribution as well. So grocery stores, convenience stores, points of sale. Uh, so when we see products that we're not familiar with, we generally know that that product is something that's unusual and we can track it down that way, which has been the case with some uh, products we found related to cannabis products as well. Got it. And nobody um, in this business is that no government agency is testing for alcohol. Maybe the winemaker is testing because that's um, re that's relevant to the winemaking process. But neither um, OLCC or ODA gets involved in the actual testing of the product. Is that correct? Uh, Chair Marsh, I don't have any awareness of I mean, ODA does not test for alcohol content. I don't know if OLCC is testing for alcohol content. Uh, no, we are not. Yeah. Are there any questions from the committee about how it works in the wine world and what what the relevance of that might be to us in looking at the the cannabis world? Um, Sheriff Zickler. Yeah, just just to further on your comment, Representative Marsh, I think it's very relevant. Is it would it be very complicated for OLCC and the ODA if there were two products that were exactly the same in appearance? but one was intoxicating and one was not, and they were packaged in the same manner. I think that's where we're facing in the uh, hemp and the marijuana industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. Thank you for that question, Sheriff Sickler. Uh, so the, uh, the reality of that uh, really kind of drives me in. I don't have any parallels to that for the winery industry, so I, I kind of have to go off, off script a little bit. Uh, that we're still going to look at the food safety and sanitation aspects. And it, it does get a little bit complicated uh, looking historically. I'm not fully up to speed on where the new rules uh, draw the lines between OLCC and ODA related to hemp and marijuana products. Uh, so in the past, so pre House Bill 3000, uh, we didn't look at the uh, the intoxicating side, if we were only looking at the, the food safety and sanitation aspects for marijuana based products and for hemp products, we were looking at it from start to finish, but we also weren't looking at any uh, uh, dosage delivery or any of those particular particulars. Uh, probably the most complicated aspect of the entire system as it stands right now is determining who has the necessary food safety licenses. Uh, because of the concentrates and the manufactured products that come out, uh, they should be coming from a food facility if they're going to be going into a food ingredient, which is uh, on level with everything else. And generally, it's hard for us to know if there's a facility we've never heard of. We assume that they're not licensed uh, and try to look at that aspect. But we wouldn't treat them any differently from our perspective at ODA if it's intoxicating or not intoxicating because that's outside of our scope and purview. Lauren Anderson. 
Uh, yeah, sure, sure, March. I just wanted to get us as close to apples to apples with our comparison as, as we can around cannabis. So Rusty and Kelly have talked about the, the winery. As far as the growing of the grapes, they're not they're not licensed like hemp growers, so that's a difference. And then they are subject, though, to the same pesticide regulations. They are subject to the same environmental, the water quality, the water issues, the water rights, and all of those kinds of things that the big difference as a farm, like anybody else growing anything else is. So that's the same. The big difference on the growing side is they don't they don't actually have a grower license like all ag crops do. The only place where we license anybody right now is hemp um, and canola. Um, so I just wanted to add that so it's full comparison all the way through. Thank you. Other questions from members of the task force? Okay, I don't, whoop, that's Warren's hand. Uh, I don't see any new hands, so thank you both for being here. I think that's really, um, it, it's really thought provoking to understand how, how we do wine and what application might that might have for um, the hemp and cannabis world. So thank you for that. My pleasure. Let's see, um, Amanda, do you see Patrick Ataji here yet? I believe he is on the on the call now. Oh, great. Patrick is, as noted, is um, president and CEO of the National Industrial Hemp Council. And um, Patrick, thank you for being here. We are really trying to come to grips with the regulatory system that we have in Oregon that shares uh, hemp and cannabis among agencies and appreciate your perspective. Are you here? If you are, we can't hear you. Sometimes on the phone, they have to hit star six to unmute. I did see um, Patrick's communications person, Larry, was able to join. Um, Larry, do you know if uh, Patrick is on the, has he called in? Yeah, uh, yes, Amanda, he was, and I was just texting with him, and he was telling me that you guys were talking about wine, so I know that he was uh, listening. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, I do know that he was on his way to the airport to board a flight for Berlin, so oh. hopefully he didn't get caught in security. Do Do you know? We you happen to. Do you know if he was going to be calling in over the phone or connecting via computer? Uh, I'm not sure if he was going to try to connect through his phone and listen in or if he was calling in or but I, I, I do believe that he was mobile because um, I talked to him and it sounded like he was in his, on his phone. So. Okay. It sounds like he's yeah. going out of his way to try to be with us. So yeah, to make work. Um, we appreciate the effort. Larry, do you would you want to say anything um, on his behalf or should we just defer if we can't get him today, should we defer his presentation to a future time? Um, I can um, I can be. Oh, he says he's on the call. Oh, uh, great. I'm texting with him right now. Um, so as Rhett Morgan noted, steal yeah, his thunder. Good. So star six can be a way to get you in if you're on the phone. We just had another phone come in, though, so we might have he not heard the star six thing. Uh, hello, this is Patrick. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. We understand uh, that you're in the middle of a number of different things um, and traveling, so we appreciate your efforts to try to make this work. We um, yeah, again. No you know the conversation going on here. We're trying to look at our regulatory structure and trying to take input from other people. So we appreciate you being here um, and are glad to hear glad to hear from you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, just as a quick background, uh, I am an Oregonian on the eastern side of the state. Um, worked for Senator Mark Hatfield back in the day. I'm showing my age, um, but you know, very involved with uh, Oregon State University Global Hemp. Innovation Center um, and others. 
And just to start off with, I know we only have five to ten minutes, but I would like to invite uh, you and the members of the panel and the task force. We are having our annual meeting, actually, in Corvallis, Oregon, um, at Oregon State University in conjunction with the Global Hemp Innovation Center. Um, so, you know, uh, it would be a complimentary um, uh, path for the day. So just, you know, contact Larry uh, Farnsworth uh, on the call um, to facilitate that. So if I may, I'll just jump right into it. Um, you know, I, I think first and foremost, hemp is legal. You know, the federal, uh, you know, passed by Congress in 2018, and it's a 0.3% threshold. And I state that, and I state the importance of that, because, you know, there, at the regulatory level, there are people looking at it from different perspectives on how to, you know, regulate uh, the Delta A, or which we don't support, or the um, the higher THC, or just in general, what do you do with it? But when tested, I mean, it's legal. Uh, I think first and foremost, we shouldn't send it through, you know, a dispensary, which is handling high THC. Uh, we should focus on, um, you know, the, the, the legal aspect of it. So that's the first part. So I would, you know, dissuade any movement of hemp, you know, through dispensaries. The second part is that, you know, there there are ways of, of regulating hemp. You you have to get a license to grow it. So there's that factor. So um, you could you could have your certificate with you in transportation. Um, the second part of that is, um, you know, th there's there's the verification program which we are unveiling. And again, that will be at our annual meeting. So I, um, you know, highly, you know, recommend that folks come down, take the the hour drive or less, depending on where you are, to learn about our verification program, which requires a testing um, of product. Um, so that that is another avenue. Um, so and again, you know, I just want to start with hemp is legal, and you know, on a broader point of it, hemp is, you know, four things um, on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's food, it's clothing, it's shelter, and it's medicine. Um, so I think we should support that versus, you know, having, you know, the criticism of it and the cartel issue. I think we can, you know, talk about that and discuss that. Uh, at the federal level, I've talked with, you know, Congressman Cliff Bentz of the 2nd Congressional District because it is, that does, you know, go down to, you know, Ashland, Medford area. Is where you know it seems to be the predominant issue. Um, I would say it's less of an issue, um, but I want to be data driven. So uh, I know you know the sheriff and, and other folks uh, are you know have theirs, but I think their data is is a year old, and that makes a big difference. So I realize I only have five to ten minutes, and your time is very important. So I would just you know say you know for a longer discussion, uh, come down to Corvallis on the 22nd, 23rd. Um, you know, we've invited, you know, the sheriff's office and, uh, you know, several congressional offices and, and have a more robust discussion. Or we can even, you know, set up a meeting. We have the uh, center available and, you know, we can we can do a breakout session. So with that, I conclude my remarks and thank you very much um, for the opportunity to speak. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Um, and again, thanks for fitting us in. We understand you're on the move. Um, is there anyone else? Patrick. Tyler. Yeah, Patrick, if you could, could you yeah. expand a little bit more? Uh, first of all, this is Tyler Bechtel with the State Police. Uh, expand a little bit more. Uh, I was kind of confused on uh, your stance on the regulation the Delta. No, the regulation of Delta 8. Um, yeah, we we believe that wasn't the intent of Congress. I know the ninth district, you know, said it was legal, but the National Industrial Hemp Council we represent both domestic and uh, international groups. Uh, there's another group out there that says it's you know it it is a whole plant, um, but we don't feel that that follows the intent of Congress. It is it is legal according to the ninth district, but I don't think that will be appealed. Um, but from our standpoint, for the National Industrial Hemp Council. Um, we don't support that, you know, in respect of that, you know, it it does have a, a slight hallucinogenic effect and so some people are looking for that. And we believe Congress, when they 
you know, uh, set the limit on Delta nine, um, didn't really have a full understanding of the 112 plus cannabinoids that we fully don't understand. I mean, in some of those, uh, Jay Nola, the director at, o- uh, at Oregon State University you know, a few months ago, released data on potential uh, uh, effect it, it can have on, on um, uh, COVID. So um, I hope that makes sense. So yes, you know, legally, uh, the Ninth District it says it's legal. But as an association, we don't feel that it fits in with the intent of Congress. Thank you for that. Tyler, do you have any follow up on that? Was that, did that satisfy your? Uh, It it did, and it gave me some research to do. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Patrick? Is that someone speaking or is that just random noise? Okay, I think that's it. Um, So colleagues, we've had a good, this has been a good overview of what the existing regulatory structure is, some alternatives. We have a Michigan model that's been presented here that would mean mean changes for us here in Oregon. We've had um, speakers uh, note the the benefit um, of hemp and the legal nature of it. I think the regulatory structure still remains a question, even when we acknowledge uh, that that hemp is legal. Um, There is still the question of how we identify and regulate those products that are pushing the limits of of what we expect in the hemp uh, realm. Tyler, your hand is still up. Did you have another question? Okay. So I would like to just take a few minutes um, for input from this group, whether or not you believe there is needed more work on this front. Are we entirely satisfied with the way that we are regulating hemp uh, and cannabis at this point? Should we um, appoint a small subcommittee to work with ODA and OLCC on any possible proposed changes? What would you, what would you like to see to happen next? And I'm just gonna open it up for any kind of comments. Uh, Brent. Um, I would just say thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I would just um, commenting off of Sheriff Sickler's, you know, the packaging when we do get to that point, having we have a universal cannabis symbol that we put on products. I mean, there may be room to come up with something, at least for Oregon, that signifies that it's a non psychoactive product, something that can be put on packaging. I think it's going to be clear if it's CBD or THC or should be, um, but maybe something to that effect that just signifies that it is a non-psychoactive product when when at least noticed in retail stores or when we're regulating those products. But there's a t- you know still a ton of work to be done around those regulated products to make sure you know the things that are in them are safe. So I just perhaps that's one way we can look at it. Thank you. Courtney Moran. Uh, Thank you very much, Representative Marsh. Yeah, the hemp industry, of course, would like to remain under ODA's regulations. And given the authority that was granted in House Bill 3000 for the additional licensing, and we, you know, we would, we did have an initial work group meeting. I want to say that was in either late January or February, and I've had discussions with ODA about engaging with that rulemaking sooner than later to have that additional licensing framework for those secondary manufacturers. And so that is something that we would like to see moving forward, but again, carried out with ODA. Um, And we do agree that we need to, that which was pointed out during the subcommittee meeting, that we do need to uh, bring in that labeling and packaging authority. Chef Sickler. Yeah, and I don't know if this would fall into the regulatory piece, but it wasn't, I think we just maybe didn't have a chance to talk about it in our law enforcement subcommittee, but that was the, maybe the enhanced penalties for um, some of the more nefarious criminal activity with around cultivation of marijuana and repeat offenders. Um, that would be something that I think this task force should, should look at seriously um, in the next legislative session. Um, 
and then for um, the ODA, you know, whether or not they keep control over the hemp industry, I think the big thing is, is, you know, are there going to be really substantial penalties for, you know, failing to comply with the regulatory rules, meaning uh, the testing and, um, you know, not getting licensed properly or not allowing inspections? Are, are those things going to have some serious teeth in them? And I, and, and I know they've been trying to work on that, but that was a pretty significant problem a couple of years ago where people were not submitting their product for testing as required or not allowing inspections and then merely opting out and then getting licenses again. So, um, you know, there's some pretty sound structure around that I think would be beneficial. Matt. Yeah, I guess mine comment is goes back to one from one of the previous, I think it was subcommittee discussion with regard to uniformity in both labeling and testing. Um, and to take it one step further, I know California is dealing with some issues around um, reference material for the testing labs. They've discovered there is no um, specific uniformity and requirements for the reference materials that the labs are all using to calibrate their equipment. And so they don't actually get uniformity from one lab to the next. And I know I'm talking to some counterparts in California who are actively working on new regulations and legislation within the California system to identify uh, specific reference materials that would be approved for all labs to use so they all have the same materials. Thank you for that. Um, Steve, March. My banner covered my mic. Um, thanks. Um, you know, I think there are some, some issues. You know, to me, it's not about who, it's about what we want to regulate for the state and consumer safety in Oregon. So, you know, if we figure out the things that we want to control with the consumer market, whether it's packaging, when testing occurs, how to separate the inert intoxicants from the intoxicating uh, deals. And then in the end, I just get to the, you know, good go. The system either needs to bring us together so it's, it's uniform, I think, in a way that law enforcement, retailers, uh, the folks that deal with this supply chain along the way understand you know, which products they're getting and where they're going. And to me, that speaks to the integration around that piece. Now, the other parts are, you know, do we have duplicative services? We have two folks doing the same thing. To me, that's just a good government decision the legislature can work with and figure out how to make here. Um, I just had one suggestion along these lines of looking at how we're dealing with that, and that is, <laughs> Just having Andrew on the line in our discussion, you know, maybe we should get the state of California here um, to talk about what they're doing around their packaging, their labeling. Uh, I know uh, it's health there that's very uh, focused on that work. Uh, cannabis control as as well, and of course the Department of Agriculture. But that might give us some some insights into what we look at. I know California is very concerned about both what crosses, you know, when we're looking at the regulation and what moves, uh, what's moving across the border illegally, what legal hemp is going where across the border and, and some issues about that. When they proffer their standards, they're gonna be a big market uh, for our hemp folks. So that's getting some understanding, I think about, you know, what they're talking, what they're talking about may provide us with some some insights as well as to how we want to look at our integration, consolidation, and uh, 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 of system here. So, so it integrates well, not just within the state of Oregon, but I think in terms of what regulatory agencies are looking for for interstate commerce, as well as you know making cannabis enforceable from a law enforcement point of view. So we get. Set. So I don't know if that's that may be helpful or not, or if the committee's interested in that. But we could certainly work on that if, if you are. Personally, I think that would be very helpful. 
any other comments from committee members? So I, I think from my perspective, I'm going to say I think that. Um, oops, am I still live here? You are. There's a couple okay. of hands up too. Um, OK, I'm not. Go ahead. I think my screen is um, freezing, so I'm not seeing the hands. Um, oh, yes, your screen is frozen. Yeah, can you can you jump in there and call on the hands? Uh, absolutely. I saw Director Marks. I saw Sergeant Bechtel. Oh, Sergeant Mark or Director put his hand down. So Sergeant Bechtel, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'd like to echo a little bit about um, what Mr. Mark said and 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 expand on on the integration and uh, making things enforceable. Kind of the universal truth truth that I've heard from law enforcement and even um, industry folks is. Uh, the complexity of uh, rules and regulations kind of um, hampers uh, both business and enforcement. And so I just wanted to um, maybe suggest that the committee think of simplification wherever possible um, while we're thinking of this integration. Uh, the more complex we get with uh, rules, regulations, the the harder they become to enforce, to prosecute, and the harder it is for uh, business to thrive. Agree. Um, are there any other hands up? I'm just going to ask you to jump in if you are wanting to speak. OK, I think from my perspective, there were two, a couple of key words that I heard here. One is uniformity. And one is simplification, and I think our when you look at the complexity um, around our current system that was presented in that chart earlier on, I think frankly we have a ways to go to get to a system that I could describe in any way as being both simplified and completely discernible to consumers or to people in the industry. So I do think there's an ongoing conversation to be had here. I think Steve, your suggestion that we look at California. Um, and what they're doing down there is a good next step. And I am hoping that you and maybe Lauren can take a look at that with the intent of coming back to our next meeting to, to suggest some next steps. Do you think that's possible? Absolutely. Lauren? Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll speak for Lauren. Lauren thinks it's possible. Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, thank you. All right, so we and Rep Marsh. Yes, I'm sorry. I was trying to find my button to jump in there too. Um, I think we're going to see some more recommendation from the subcommittees as well. But one of those areas that, as others were jumping in, that I forgot to bring up in our subcommittee on law enforcement was also the ramifications of the large producers, those that are 100 hoop houses versus one hoop house. You know, what's the impact? Is there, a, do we need to look at a tiered system of violation? So not just the repeat offenders, where we've had them in our community that literally have plants in the ground a week after uh, they were busted by law enforcement and they have new plants in the ground um, and are unlicensed. So we've had both, but I know Sheriff Sickler has brought up the, the tiered system and I, I think we're going to need some time to delve into what those tiers should look like and and stuff like that. So um, and does tier system need to be in production as well or just in harvest? So uh, maybe just a topic to throw out there. Oh, and Courtney Moran's hands up too. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we're looking forward to having that discussion with the subcommittee, the law enforcement subcommittee. So I'm glad that um, the sheriff and you have both brought that up. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Courtney. Anybody else want to jump in on this? Madam Chair, sorry, I didn't manage to get my hand up this steep again. Um, I just wanted to point out that I think, you know, as we're thinking about this, there's really different, you know, if, they, if we knew the hemp plant was being used for industrial hemp, right, it wouldn't be a problem. It's really the intentionality of mm -hmm. what the plants can be used, the cannabis plant can be used for. And I think we got to think in that because that changes your idea about you know, where appropriate regulation might occur for the intentionality of it. 
And then I think it's us figuring out how to make those consumer products clearly discernible from each other and from the illegal market when we're talking about consumables. But I, I just wanted to put that notion of the intentionality because I don't think it's as simple as saying we're an agricultural product on this path because we know the agricultural product can be used in other ways and maybe and should be and people do want to try to use it in those ways. Um, both some are advocating for changes, you know, to get legalized synthetics based out of that cannabinoid mass production right into the system, which may be something, you know, if uh, we have the proper safety test on it that we might be interested in, but because the illegal market's clearly working on with those things already. Um, so I just wanted to put that notion out there because I think it's a little more complex than this is what we're doing goes to a simple channel of consumer market. It can go to a lot of channels of consumer market. Yes, thank you. Sergeant Bechtel's hands up again. Please just jump in. At this point, I can't see the hands because I'm frozen out, but I can hear all of you. So <laughs> don't wait. Don't wait for me to call on you, Sergeant Bechtel. Thank you, Chair Marsh. And at the risk of of uh, taking more than than uh, my share of time here, I just wanted to um, ask that the members of the law enforcement committee remind me on our meeting of the 29th. I don't think we've really talked about trafficking, uh, labor trafficking and worker exploitation enough. And I think we kind of left that off. I I wanted to just uh, that forward that uh, we should we should uh, remind ourselves to look at at maybe uh, the current laws for exploitation of workers. And then um, I just wanted to get in. I believe it would have been into the Water and Natural Resources Committee that um, early on we were talking about cleanup costs and and how those are addressed. Um, when you guys get to that, I, I want to tell you a little bit about the state forfeiture system and about how uh, the drug lab cleanup fund works. Um, uh, we, we do use that, especially in cases of uh, marijuana concentrates and uh, cleaning up chemicals associated with that. So uh, just more general comments there and uh, things to get on our to do list. Thank you, Tyler. Um, we have touched on the question of cleanup costs in the Water and Natural Resources Committee, so we'll, we, um, but we haven't focused on it yet. So we'll make sure that we invite you to talk about that, um, maybe at our next meeting. In terms of labor trafficking, that was a subject we knew this committee should address, and we also thought it could be addressed in the context of the full committee. Although certainly the law enforcement subcommittee may want to dive in in some ways, but we will be scheduling a discussion at the full committee and we're planning to invite DOJ to be there as well as representatives from the organizations that have accepted um, money from the Criminal Justice Commission to work on specifically on labor trafficking issues. So I think it, it'll be important for us to hear from those organizations that are on the ground and what they see as being the services uh, that need to be provided to, to intersect um, labor trafficking. That's more about responding to the the victims than it is about preventing. Um, but we will have a, I think, a good, robust conversation at the whole group level when we have those folks come in. Okay, with that, um, I think we have we have some next steps. Steve and Lauren are going to look at some models and come back to us on the subject of how we organize um, for a system that is simple and uniform um, and un understood by consumers as well as people who are in the business. And with that, we will move on to the rest of the agenda. Um, we have always on the on all of our agendas a place for public comment. What I don't know is if anybody has signed up for comment. Amanda, can you help me with that? Yep, we do have um, one person signed up. Uh, Lee Berger signed up for um, public comment. Okay, Lee, are you here? If so, this is your moment. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay, I'm trying to get the video to work too. Well, our technology is a little limited this morning, so don't worry if you don't have your video. We can we can hear you, so you can go right ahead. Hi, can you see me now as well? My name is Leland Berger. I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing for 39 years. 
I've been practicing statewide from uh, Portland during that period of time. I've been practicing um, in Jackson and Josephine counties uh, since the mid 90s. And I will continue to do so as long as people are arrested relating to cannabis. Um, I uh, lobbied at the legislature on, on behalf of uh, consumers and uh, and cannabis law reform between 1999 and 2019. But my um, impact was limited during the pandemic for a variety of reasons. I did write a letter in opposition to Senate Bill uh, 3000, and um, that was uh, received as evidence. But that that was the long and short of it. It's it's troubling to me as uh, my practice includes uh, criminal defense, including cannabis uh, crimes and forfeitures. Um, and licensing and compliance work with largely with Steve's agency. And I uh, had hoped um, nearly 10 years ago when I transitioned my practice from a, a home office to a real office that it would mostly be licensing and compliance. But unfortunately, again, it's, it's mostly criminal defense. The reason I'm dressed this way is I appeared virtually this morning in the Josephine County Circuit Court um, for a status conference on a case that's not a cannabis case, but it's instructive, I think, to this committee. It's a felon in possession case where there was of a, of a firearm, where my client was stopped on I-5 following an investigation that began in Grants Pass and wound up on I-5. And the police agencies involved were the um, Grants Pass police and um, the uh, and the Oregon State Police. And so as a consequence, there is a significant amount of body worn camera video evidence because both the Grants Pass Police and the State Police have that capacity. Neither the Jackson County Sheriff's Office nor the Josephine County Sheriff's Office has that. And it ought to be a requirement for any funding for any police agency involved in cannabis enforcement that they be required to wear body worn cameras. It would certainly cut down the, on the number of clients of mine who report to me about law enforcement taking things that they don't include in the evidence reports and just in general to get some accountability, I think, from law enforcement. I can tell you that body worn cameras in, for example, my um, cannabis uh, DUI practice has been really helpful to the state because it's challenging to prove that a person is impaired, which, by the way, is a much better word, and I had included this in my letter about 3,000 that intoxicating cannabis, and I'm not sure how many of you are consumers, and I haven't consumed, frankly, in a year. I fell down a flight of stairs and broke four toes, and I, I just, I haven't been, but I, historically, I have been, and I know what the experience is, and the experience is not intoxicating, but it can be impairing, and that's protected by the driving under the influence law, now that we've legalized. <clears throat> but, um, the body-worn cameras or even the dashboard-mounted ca cameras that Tyler knows is on the state police vehicles and often is on county vehicles as well, county sheriff vehicles as well, um, are helpful to the prosecutor in um, driving under the influence of cannabis cases because to actually see the driver, because they're difficult cases for the state to prove, because again, it's it can while it can be impairing, it's not intoxicating. Um, I also wanted to correct something that uh, Representative uh, Morgan said. She said that uh, sometimes it's uh, visually indistinguishable. And I also wanted to speak to the nomenclature. The statutes say, and uh, this is largely due to Rob Bovet, that uh, cannabis is the plant. Marijuana is the plant that's more than this arbitrary 0.3% THC, and hemp is less than 0. 3% THC, but it's all indistinguishable by vision, by smell. And the reason I talk about the need for accountability in law enforcement is because, particularly in Jackson and Josephine counties, the courts are issuing uh, search, seize, and destroy warrants. And it's not untypical for it to be contested about whether what's destroyed is hemp or not hemp. And law enforcement is not being held accountable because when they destroyed what was a licensed hemp facilities hemp, and that business sued in federal court for the Fourth Amendment violation for the, the unlawful seizure and destruction of their property, the 
federal magistrate in Medford ruled that it's not fair to require the police to be able to distinguish between the two. So there's no accountability for the destruction of hemp through the efforts to eradicate um, unlicensed, which I think is also a better way to describe what we're talking about. There's no, growing a plant is not illegal, but it became illegal if it's unlicensed post legalization. You know, I, one of the most disappointing parts about the legislative action post legalization was then Senator Burdick's comment about that the people didn't know what they were voting for and, and we're free to do whatever they, we want. And the reason the, the medical marijuana program isn't on Amanda's chart is because there's currently one medical marijuana dispensary. There's no medical marijuana processors and the number of patients and caregivers has been decimated as well by legislative actions relating to and we still haven't come up with, despite my efforts to work with Amanda and Steve, a way within the, the regulated um, adult use system to come up with a program to, to take care of uh, patients. So Lee, um, I'm gonna ask you if you- I have just, I can, um, I can wrap it up, I'm almost Yeah, done. thank you. I, I think the, I've been working extensively with a uh, deputy district attorney in Josh's office, who he's losing at the end of this month. And um, I think that she and I agree that it's not the growing of the plants that's the problem. It's it's these collateral impacts, the uh, 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 stealing water during the bush drought for a long time and despoiling the land through um, pesticides and um, and other environmental crimes. Um, I, in addition to dealing with Josh's office and with his corollary in Jackson County, I've also dealt with the Jackson County Planning Department and with the Josephine County Legal Council. And the fact is that the nuisance and abatement lawsuits that the Josephine County Legal Council has brought have been really effective, as have the efforts on the part of Jackson County to enforce their requirement that you get a permit if you're gonna have a greenhouse. And which is to say that instead of having people pay me to defend them against criminal charges, the way that these counties can make up for the timber money they lost is, is, by, uh, is by fines. You know, $100 a plant, for example. I think that's the kind of a thing that's gonna stop a lot of the larger scale stuff. But, and, and, when I, when, and, and I want you to know that when I talk with Josh's deputy, who's leaving the end of the month, and I called her up to settle a case and said, you know, my clients are not bad people. She said to me, I'm prosecuting 100 people, Lee, only two of them are bad. So, you know, the, 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 I'm not saying, I want Amanda not to be afraid, right? I want Brent to be able to compete appropriately. These are my friends. I've known them both a long time. And I just, on the one hand, but I want the committee to know that this problem is not as significant as law enforcement has been describing it. And whether you call it a cartel or a drug trafficking organization, what I'm seeing statewide, mostly following um, Tyler's cases, is a brown and yellow workers being arrested. You know, it's still a racist drug war and this is what the people absolutely voted to stop. So, those are the suggestions I had. I was really kind of surprised when I saw the legislation that there isn't a criminal defense lawyer that's a part of this group. It doesn't have to be me. You know, OCDLA has, a, the Oregon Criminal Defense Lawyers Association has a lobbyist, but there ought to be somebody who can provide this committee with that perspective. And I'm certainly willing to assist. And as Amanda knows, I've been monitoring these and waiting for today to be able to speak my piece. And I, um, Thank, and I certainly thank. have clients who are interested in the other stuff about the um, the cannabinoids the, uh, that that may be impairing but aren't delta nine, and the artificially derived cannabinoids and all that stuff. But um, okay. I'm, I, I am going to ask you. I've been watching and I'm interested. And I'm willing to help, and I, I appreciate you allowing me to speak. Uh, thank Marsh. you. We we appreciate. And that's your... that's all I have to say today. Thank you. We appreciate your comments. Um, we have just a couple minutes left, and that's enough time to talk about next steps. Amanda, do we have a next meeting scheduled yet? We do. Um, our next meeting is going to be Thursday, August 25th, 
from three o'clock to five o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. okay, presume that everybody has that on the calendar. And then it looks like there was potentially an opportunity for a CDS demo. Do you want to speak to that? Yep, um, we have a quick um, presentation. It hasn't been scheduled yet. I'm hoping to schedule it for the end of uh, July. Um, I think the thought is we'll go ahead and send out an invite. If people can make it, great. Um, if not, we'll have the recording of it on our website so people could review it afterwards. Um, and it's just a PowerPoint demonstration with some screenshots to kind of show how the tracking system works and how various um, agencies use that data and then how we use it at the OLCC. Great. And just to be clear, that is for legal cannabis. Correct. Yes. At, at least at this point. OK, lots um, this every time we have one of these meetings, it sort of emphasizes for me the complexity of what we're dealing with here. Um, and I appreciate the willingness of this committee to jump in either in the discussions with all of us or and or with our subcommittees, which are going to have the ability to go much more deeper into the weeds than we can at this at this committee. Um, thank you for being here. And unless anybody else has something they want to quickly throw in, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, everybody.